Um, so the four things we're going to do, first, we're going to talk about heat capacity. You've heard this term already. Specific heat capacity is the phrase you've seen it in chemistry. We're going to talk about the idea of calorimetry and how conservation applies to it. Conservation of energy, that is. We'll talk about the heating curve of any fluid, specifically water, but any fluid in general, or any substance in general. And then finally, we'll take a look at calculating the heat needed to change temperature or to change phase. Temperature and, and or phase, either one of those. So let's start first with our definition of specific heat capacity. Now, the definition is what leads us to this formula. Make sure that's clear. It's the amount of energy needed, that's Q right here, the amount of energy needed, Q, to change one kilogram of a substance, that's the mass, by one degree Celsius, that's the change in temperature. Again, if I have a certain material, let's say copper, a copper pipe, and I want to heat it up, Q is the amount of energy needed to heat it up by one degree Celsius if that copper pipe is one kilogram in mass. This rearranged gives us another formula. What formula does this give us if I rearrange it? You've seen it already. If I rearrange this formula for C, what does it give us that you've already seen? Yeah, that's exactly it. Multiply both sides by M delta T. Multiply both sides by M delta T, right? Cancel, cancel. So this we were referring to the other day, okay, is our heat transfer law as far as we're considering, um, as far as we're considering energy for changing a phase in temperature, for changing a phase in temperature. So MC delta T, it really comes from the definition of specific heat capacity. So Q is still the amount of heat needed, M is the mass of the substance, C is the specific heat of the substance, and delta T is how much the temperature changes by. What does delta mean really in math? Delta means always? Change, right? Change. What minus what? Very good. The end minus the starting. Final minus initial. Final minus initial. Okay, so this is our formula we're going to use. The formula that's in the box right there is on your formula sheet. Right? It's not the first one that you were given. I want you to show where it comes from. So I give the definition of specific heat and then solve for Q. This is given right here on your formula sheet. Um, again, this should be a bit of review. What are the units of Q? Units of heat. Units of heat or energy or work. What are those units always going to be? Heat, energy, work, heat, energy, work. Joules. Okay, we got joules here. Um, so we can see that our C value has very intricate units. Just look at the definition of C up here to see the units. Q, measured in joules. Mass, measured in kilograms. Temperature, measured in degrees Celsius. So here are your units for the C value right here. They come from the definition of C. That's where the units come from themselves. Um, all right. Now, materials have different C values at different phases. In this table, we see most things as a solid. Okay, this is assuming STP. What is STP again? In chemistry, STP stood for? Uh, standard T pressure. Standard, what do you think T is? Thermal. Temperature, thermal and temperature. Standard temperature and pressure. At STP, these substances are mainly solids. Obviously, what's not a solid is steam and water, right? So everything up until steam and water is a solid. You've got aluminum, copper, glass, gold, ice, which is just the same thing as water, but as a solid. Iron, lead, mercury, and silver. Those are all solid elements here, or solid substances. Steam and water are the same as ice, just in different phases. Okay, so recognize that these are really all the same thing. Those are all H2O. Right? One is in the gas phase, one is in the liquid phase, one is in the solid phase. We've got gases, we've got liquids, we've got solids here. Now, what's interesting to recognize is that depending upon the problem you have, you have to use a different value. In the lab, or in the lab demo rather, that we did the other day here, in the lab demo, which of the values am I going to end up using here? Which of the values do I use? For what we did, for what we did. We could use something different if we have alternate a little bit. We'll talk about how alternate. 
we just have cold water to hot water. What are we using for C? What's the actual value? Water? Yeah, we're just using water itself. But what did we talk about? We could have done. We talked about the fact that it wouldn't have made sense to do this because it would have had a phase change and stuff. Yes, like juice or something? Not juice. That was the example of class that was there was juice, yeah. What did the phase of uh, I set it up with the other class yesterday and then talked to you guys about it during the class yesterday. Remember I started the experiment I was saying at the beginning of class, at the beginning of the school day? <laughs> what could I have done? Remember I said I could have added ice to the water bath to start with a colder temperature? But what would the problem have been if I added ice to that to start? If I added ice to one of them, I added ice water, and then I had boiling water in the other one and heat transfer starts occurring. Why would that have caused some sort of an issue with our results? If it were ice water and hot water versus just cold water and hot water. We'll assume the same amount of water in both. Nothing about the mass being different. But one is ice water and hot water versus just cold water and hot water, not ice water. Why would that be different? Think about today, think about what we're doing right now. It's a solid and a liquid. Okay, one's a solid, the other's a liquid. All right, we're on the right track. To change into? Yeah, we'd have to melt the ice first, which would take a lot of energy just to melt the ice. And then the temperatures would start changing. So that temperature scale that we saw, or that temperature, the graph that we saw, I'll put it back up so you can see. And this graph that we saw a little while ago, it started changing temperature right away. This dropped dramatically, this increased dramatically, not, not as dramatically as that drop, but this increased right away. If you had had ice water, this temperature, first of all, would have been much lower to start. It would have been like maybe five degrees Celsius, if not lower. And for a little while, you would have seen no temperature change at all. And then all of a sudden, you would have seen the temperature change. When the temperature wasn't changing, all the energy that was being taken in was going into changing the ice into liquid water. And then once it's all water, you'll see the temperature start to rise. So in this section, in this lesson today, we're really focusing on phases and temperature changes. Here now, we only are looking at specific instances where most things are solids. But if we go from, for example, okay, if we go from something such as uh, water at 80 degrees to water at 130 degrees Celsius, what do we know happens in between there at some point? 80 degrees Celsius water to 130 degrees Celsius water. What has to happen somewhere along the way? It starts boiling. The boiling part of water, you should know, it's 100 Celsius. We'll have a table with some of the values in a minute. But you should know the boiling point of water at least, okay? So if it goes from 80 to 130, what happens? It goes from 80 all the way up to 100, it stops changing temperature, and then it starts to boil. Once it all boils off as a gas, then the gas can elevate beyond 100 degrees. Whenever you hit a point of boiling or freezing, you have to lose energy at that instant. So that would have been a problem if we did that with the experiment. If you wanted it to be 130 degrees Celsius, wouldn't you have to put like, salt in it or something? For water to be? Yeah. Yes, because that water elevates water the steam. boiling temperature. Yeah. It would steam off. That was actually a question I asked the other class. Why do you add salt to water before you boil it for like pasta? And nobody seemed to know. Everybody thought it had to do with changing the specific heat capacity, but it's actually exactly what you said. It's elevating the boiling point. You have boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. In chemistry, you learn about when you add salt to something, it changes the rate, but not the rate, the point at which it'll boil or freeze. And you've ever, ever made your own ice cream at home? Ever made your own ice cream? You take a bag of ice cold water, like a bunch of ice cubes, you pour a ton of salt in it. You take another bag, in that you put heavy cream, and put like a flavoring, like banana or chocolate or something like that, or vanilla, like uh, fresh van uh, vanilla, vanilla extract. I was gonna say imitation. A vanilla extract in there. You take the little bag with cream and vanilla, put it inside the bigger bag that has ice cubes and salt, because the salt will lower the freezing temperature as a result. So that ice water bath will get really, really cold. And you just sit there and you can just shake it up for a while. And the cream will eventually turn into ice cream. So anyhow, that's how you would lower the, lower the freezing temperature of ice. And the same thing happens with the boiling point of water. Um, i trying to think. All right, let's look at an example of this. Okay, we'll talk about calorimetry and an example of this. So 
Calorimetry is something that in chemistry you talked about for a little while, and you did a lab on this where you took a piece of hot metal, I forget what it was, but you heated it up and dropped it into a water basin, and you looked at the change in temperature to see how much heat was lost or gained. Well, physically, what's happening here is this. Imagine you have some sort of a container. In that container, you've got a fluid. Maybe it's water, maybe it's a liquid specifically, and it's water. And then in that, you drop in some piece of specimen that's been heated up. So the specimen that you drop in is at a high temperature. The water is at a low temperature. Which way will heat flow? Which way will the energy itself flow? What is the direction of heat in this process? It goes from the, the inner and it goes off the metal to the outside, which is the water. Very good. Okay, remember it always flows from hot to cold, or high temperature to low temperature. So in this case, the, the metal is heated up in cold water. <laughs> you drop it into the cold water, all the heat from the metal is gonna go into the water. And we saw that, in a sense, with that example, but we'll see it more in the next example itself, mathematically. Okay, so if I were to think about this, because of conservation of energy, I know that the amount of heat that one thing gives off, plus the amount of heat that the other thing gains, has to equal zero. This is conservation of energy right here. Q1, call that the heat given off by the metal. Q2, call that the heat absorbed by the water. When you sum them together, you get zero. Because one is losing heat and one is gaining heat. So it's like one is positive and one is negative. So for these problems, a lot of the time with calorimetry, you say the following. Q1 equals negative Q2. This is not given. This is not given. I'm in the process of grading your tests and ripping my hair out because 75% of students, for some reason, forgot the formula F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2. Again, a formula in the last chapter that was not given, you were taught, you were, you learned about Pascal's principle and P1 equaling P2, and then you plug in F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2. That's where that came from. It wasn't given to you as a formula. So you can't assume that because it's not in the formula sheet, you're not going to use it. This is one of those instances where this is just theory. Where does this idea come from? This idea right here comes from conservation of energy. The energy that one object loses must be gained by the other object, conservation. So I know that when I sum those, the gain plus the loss has to equal zero. Okay, and that easily is written this way. The gain of one object equals the loss of the other object. Okay, the gain on one equals the loss on the other. Yeah, the last test, I don't know, people just suddenly stop remembering formulas. A lot of formulas were made mistakes. And some that were even given on the test, too, but that other one was not on the test. It's not on the formula sheet, rather, so you have to remember the stuff from the theory. It's not that you have to memorize the formula, but if you remember conservation of energy, you should know Q1 plus Q2 is always zero. The amount of energy gain and loss has to balance, has to balance. So this problem is exactly that example. Okay, we, we're told that we have a piece of copper piping. When you want to bend metal, what do you normally do to it? When you want to bend metal. Yeah, you heat it up, you heat it up. Okay, you can melt it and then reforge it completely, but if you just want to bend metal, you can heat it up to a certain value and then actually apply force to it to get it to start to bend. So a copper pipe that you want to create a bend in, you can actually heat with a blowtorch and with a, a, a mallet really, and an anvil, you can bend a copper pipe into whatever shape you want. Okay? There are some that are more malleable than others, and those are used in these applications. And usually, you use alloys. You don't always use a pure element. So you're not using pure copper. Like gallium, it'll melt in your hand. What about what? Like gallium, it'll melt in your hand. What's the, what's the melting temperature? It's, uh, it's like 95 or something like that. So if your hand is around it, really, yeah, 95. Yeah, so like the trick that you should do to make a gallium spoon is stir it in some like slightly warm water, and the spoon disappears because it almost melts. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. I never knew that. That metal's called gallium? Yeah. It's illegal. No. It's illegal. No, it's slightly radioactive. My brother somehow got a hold of a bunch of it. <laughs> right he just came over and he's like, look what I found. It melts in your hand. And I'm like, where is it on the table? It's got to be toward the bottom if it's radioactive. What, what element? Like, what, where is it near? It's like, I think it's I'm just like, curious. It might even be a bottle. But it's a metal 
that naturally, I guess... It has a super low moment. Yeah, that's really low for a metal. Interesting. Um, so we have copper here, we're bending it. We heat it up to 95 degrees Celsius, get it bent into the shape, and then drop it in a basin of water. It's a half a kilogram of copper, two kilograms of water. Now, Q, from a moment ago, Q is equal to simply MC delta T. That's assuming there's no phase changes. We'll get the phase changes in about, I don't know, five minutes or so. For now, we're assuming no phase change, just the change in temperature, meaning the water is gonna heat up and the copper is gonna cool down. Okay, the water will heat up, the copper will cool down. Something else to notice, this is, actually I'll wait till the end of the problem, see if anyone pick up on it. So let's replace with the formula. So we've got M, C, delta T, and M, C, delta T. It's the same formula, right? One of them is gaining though, and one of them is losing. Which is gaining energy here, the water or the copper? Which is gaining energy, the water or the copper? The water. So for the sake of this problem, let's write that this is the water and this is the copper. It doesn't matter though, okay? For two objects, it doesn't matter which one goes in which spot because the negative sign would just end up canceling out. Now, at this point, all you have to do is fill in. The common mistake though is temperature. People have a lot of problems with the temperature part. A minute ago we said delta T means final minus initial, right? Final minus initial. Please expand a little bit further. Okay, and rewrite it as final minus initial. So this is T1, the first object's final temperature minus the first object's initial. The second object's final minus the second object's initial. <clears throat> eventually, eventually, the copper will cool down enough where there will become a point where no more heat is being transferred. At that point, what do we call that again? What's the phrase for that? They're in a state of equilibrium. equilibrium. Now, when they're in equilibrium, thermal equilibrium specifically, we know thermal equilibrium can exist only if their blank are the same. Temp Temperatures, very good. So T1F and T2F will eventually be the same value. Again, the copper starts at a temperature here. We'll send a focus. The water starts at a temperature here. The two things eventually merge in temperatures to have the exact same temperature at the end of the problem. It cools off. So T1F and T2F are the same thing, actually. So if you want to, on the next line, just call them T. Remember when M1 equaled M2, we just called it M? If T1F and T2F are the same time, final temperature, just use T instead. Everything else in the problem is given. If it's not in the problem, where is it? Either you're solving for it for T, but I mean like the C values, they're not in the problem, right? They're not given. Where do you find the C values? In the table on the previous slide. Okay, it's given as some sort of a constant somewhere. In a table at the bottom of your formula sheet, right? I can't tell you how many people on the last test for P0 didn't know what P0 was. P0 is the atmospheric pressure. It's a constant. It's on your formula sheet. I would say like a third of the class ignored that part of the formula or just put in like whatever number they felt like putting in. It's a constant, it's on your formula sheet for a reason. So please reference it. Here on the test, you're gonna either be given the C values or I'll give you that table at the end of the test and you reference it from the actual table. So let's fill in what we know. We know that on the left side we have the water and there are two kilograms of water. The heat capacity of water is 4.186 times 10 to the third. The water started at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, the copper, on the other hand, there was a fourth in mass. There was literally only 0.5 kilograms, one fourth of the mass of the water. There are four times as much water as there is copper, which makes sense. Usually when you want to cool something down, you put it in a bigger basin of that fluid to cool it off, right? You wouldn't, I mean, you can't cool off a, a, a sword with less water than the sword is, right? It wouldn't make sense to do that. You would usually have a bigger water source. So we know that we have a half a kilogram of copper. The heat capacity of copper, anybody have that from the table? What do you got, Jenna? Yeah. 
and the copper started at 95 degrees. Okay, so here's the heat capacity of water. Here's the heat capacity of copper. Which is greater? And it's not, I don't want to say why, but which is greater and how will it affect the problem? Heat capacity of water, heat capacity of copper. How will one being greater than the other affect the problem? We think, Matt? One side is negative. One side is negative, but I'm asking not about the negative side. I'm saying, how will one of these being greater than the other affect the problem? They're not the same values. If it was water and water like we had over there, the C values are technically the same. Because it's water and water. But this is water and copper. What do you think? Yeah, so the equilibrium will not be exactly in between. It's not going to be between 95 and 25, right? It's going to be near the higher heat capacity number. So in this case, water has a higher heat capacity. It can take a lot of the heat from the copper without even changing its temperature much. So the equilibrium temperature will definitely be closer to 25. It's also because we have more water than we have copper. The mass of the water is greater for that than copper. The specific heat capacity of water is greater than that of copper. So as a result, the water's temperature isn't going to change much, but the copper could change a whole lot. So the temperature of equilibrium will not be closer to 95, it will be closer to 25 instead. Okay, to 25 instead. How do we solve a problem like this? It looks really complicated, right? When I look at this at first instinct, I'm like, oh man, I've got T in two spots, it looks really confusing. What should I do? Step me through the process. Martha, what do you think? Yeah, to do that, what do you think the first step should be, Martha? Um, We're going to try and get T by itself, but right now it's on both sides, right? Yeah. What should I start with, you think? Well, I don't, unfortunately, there's nothing being added or subtracted right now, right? Notice that? I don't have a plus or minus sign. These are all time signs. So it might be tempting to divide to start. You could probably divide by these two if you wanted to to get rid of them, really. But you could do something else that's a little bit simpler to start. Why don't you phone a friend? Um, what I would do is I would take the, the ones that aren't, like on this side, I would uh, take that, divide it into that one, and then divide the, the T. To, and you end up with um, the two bubbles divided by the two bubbles, and then the time divided by the time. But then you would have time over time. How do you solve for time there, right? You'd have t minus 95 over t minus 25, which is see what you're doing, but then you have a t in the top and bottom, right? Which makes it hard to solve. It's actually, it's the easiest way that you're not looking for right now. It's like almost like when the problem is too easy to answer kind of thing. What do you, what do you think? Be help for a second. Let's see. Would you multiply the numbers on the left side and distribute? Yeah, I would distribute. Did you see it once I said that, Marilyn, that it would be an easier way? Why is distributing the easy method here? Or the, the easiest method? Yeah, you give T a coefficient. A coefficient. So figure out what the number is in red, please. Q times 4.186 times 10 to the third. Take that number, whatever that is, and distribute it to both T and negative 25. Distribute that value to T and to negative 25. And tell me what we end up getting on the left-hand side as a result. I'm going to get something t minus something else. I know that. Minus. What do you got when you multiply it by 25? You got a different number? Did anyone else get 8372? I think it's 8372 here. Check, Tiana. 2 times 4.186 times 10 to the third. And Andrew, what was the second number? How about the right hand side? Do the same thing, please. Take this negative, notice it's a negative coefficient here, and distribute the negative coefficient to both of these on the right hand side. It's going to be negative and then something with a t, and then this is going to be plus now. 
193.5. And then take 193.5 times 95. It's going to be negative, negative, which makes that a positive. What does that other number give me? 18. What do you got? Okay. At this point, at this point, it's up to you to solve. You should all know how to solve from here. T is your variable. It's on both sides. Combine like terms. Take the negative right here, please. Add it over to the left-hand side. So start with that first. Take this negative here. Add it over to the right-hand side. You'll get something when you move this over with a T. You'll get a constant over here. Divide through to get the value of T. You get something T equals some number. And then something goes here, and that equals some number over here. You can jump to the answer if you want. Give me a number, it's fine at this point. Or give me an intermediate, I don't care, either one's fine. There's no really like algebraic solution in this though, notice that? Yeah, we could have found an algebraic solution if we distributed everything and solved for t algebraically. Technically speaking, it would have worked, but it would be really messy. This is one of the few times I plug in earlier on. Either an answer or the intermediate step, either one. I see zero calculators in the entire back row. Zero calculators out right now. Tana. On the left side? <laughs> you need to add this guy over here to the right side. So the 200,000 number should be over here. And then add this one over to here to combine the like terms that both have T in them. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So this number plus this number instead of minus, because you're going to add it over, gives you this coefficient. What do you got? Um, for the second one, I got 8,178.5. No, you're subtracting. You need to add. No. Right? Look, this is a negative already. So it needs to be added to this. You, you, can't, have eight, you can't have a number less than this, right, Marilyn? Okay. Go ahead, Marilyn. Keep going. And then the T had the coefficient of what? Matt, help her out. Okay, so if you, if you move them the other direction, you're going to get negative, negative, which ends up being positive still anyway. Okay? And then divide by 8565.5 on both sides to get T by itself. Okay, around 26 and a half or 10, 26 and 6 tenths. Please make sense of the answer. Why is it closer to 25? Because we have water, we have more of it, and water has a higher C value than copper. Whichever has the higher C value is the one that you're most likely going to have a temperature closer to. Okay, assuming that the masses are at least the same. In this case, there's more water, so it's definitely going to be closer to the water temperature because there's more water and a higher C value. And more water and a higher C value. Hey, do you get now why the ocean doesn't warm up very quickly? Does it make sense? Water has a very high C value, actually. It's, its tendency to retain heat or its tendency to gain heat is very difficult. And it also has a lot of mass. So if you think about the ocean, compared to your pool, in the summertime your pool heats up pretty quickly, but the ocean takes a long time because there's A, a lot more mass in it. And in general, water has a relatively high specific heat capacity. Questions so far? We're gonna hop into something else now, so I ask if you have anything, please. All right, now, 
All we did so far was temperature changes. That's it. We looked at the temperature change of, in this case, copper and water when mixed together. Now we have to consider the fact, you know what? What happens if there's a phase change? So a phase change, unfortunately, causes you to lose or gain energy that's a little bit more than a temperature change. Okay, it's a little bit more extreme than a temperature change. So we're trying to phase change one kilogram of a substance here, one kilogram. Why isn't temperature involved in this formula? Look at the formula here. The last one was C equals Q over M delta T. Where did the delta T go? The last formula had delta T in the denominator. That was the only difference. Where did the delta T go? Why is there no delta T involved here? Come on, use the context of the problem. Same two hands for the most part, same three. Use the context of the problem. What are we physically doing here? Why is there no delta T involved at all? No delta T. Matt, help us out. You need more to describe than that. You're like on the right track, you're not saying it right. Why is there no delta T involved here? There's no delta T. T is not time. So Think about it, guys. A change in phase eliminates a change in temperature completely. You're going from one state to another. You go from gas to liquid, or liquid to solid. When that happens, here's what's physically happening, ready? Right? Put an ice cube on the table. The ice cube itself, maybe it's at negative five Celsius. At first, the temperature starts to rise until it gets to zero Celsius. Then, all the ice melts into water. That water is still at zero Celsius. Then the water technically begins to heat up. So when you have a change in phase, the temperature isn't really changing. There's no change in temperature occurring. So it's like, all right, I have ice. I want to get it to zero. That's a change in temperature. Once the ice is at zero, it has to melt to water, still at zero. Then I go from water at zero to water at 100. Then it evaporates for a while. Then it's gas at 100 and above. So every time you reach a boiling point or a freezing point, you have to have a phase change. When you have a phase change, there's no temperature change, therefore there's no delta T in this formula. Solve this formula for Q, just like we did the last one. When you solve for Q, you get Q equals? Yeah, ML or L times M. It's that, that's our heating curve. That's our heating curve. We'll see that in a minute. We'll get, we'll get to that, yep. So Q is the amount of energy, listen, needed to change the phase. When you see an L in the formula, you know you're looking at the latent heat. Latent means the energy needed to change within the actual atomic structure. So you're physically changing from a lattice structure to a, a liquid that's more amorphic, to a gas where the molecules are further spread out. You're physically changing something because of the amount of heat that you need to change that is stored within the actual item. So L, standing for latent, this has to do with phase changes. Now you have latent heat of fusion, LF, and latent heat of vaporization, LV. Those two things are different. It actually, we're gonna see in a moment, it turns out that it takes more energy to make steam than it does to make ice. Take a pot, a pot of water or a piece of water, you pour it into an ice tray. It takes less energy to freeze into cubes than it does for the same amount of water to boil off into gas, into some sort of steam. The values of LF and LV are different. F, standing for fusion, is when you have a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a solid. That's why there's a biconditional here, the arrow both ways. The heat of vaporization, think about vapors. Evaporation, vapors, evaporation. That has to do with liquid to gas or gas to liquid. For F, you could remember F for fusion or F for freezing. That works too. Okay, some students use the F here and remember it as freezing instead of fusion. It's the same thing really, okay? So now, we've given this as our, as our part of the formula. 
Let's go to the next slide now. Okay, let's go to the next slide. What we're looking at here is a table of six elements or six materials or substances of which have different boiling and melting temperatures. The melting point and the boiling point are different for each of these. Which one is the one we know? Water, zero and 100. That's the one that you should know. The others you do not have to memorize. Okay, water is zero and water is 100. You don't have to actually memorize the others. Um, the others will always be given to you in a table form. So obviously you can see all these values. Why are these values important? Why are they important? What do you think? What do you think? Why are they important? They're on the table for a reason, right? The boiling point and the melting point. It's got to be a reason we'll utilize them. Yeah, exactly. It tells you when the phase changes. So for example, if I'm working with lead, okay, find lead please. If I'm working with lead and I go from lead at a temperature of 120 Celsius to a temperature of 475 Celsius, lead, okay, what occurs physically throughout this process? Explain to me what would be happening. Give me like a story as to what would happen to lead. Lead at 120 to lead at 475. Step me through the process that you would undergo. Okay, I guess. So first, you would just be chilling while you would be solid. You wouldn't be doing anything. You wouldn't slowly even probably start to expand. Yeah. Yeah. So you would just be chilling while you would be solid. You wouldn't slowly even probably start to expand. Okay. And then finally, you would end up melting. All right, so from 120 up until what point would it keep expanding? Until 327, it would begin to melt. And then, um, and then at 3, so slow down. At 327, what do you have? Is it solid? Is it liquid? But what is it really? It would start to become Yeah, it's kind of both, right? It's a little mixture. So this occurs. So first, we've got a change in temperature. Then we've got a change in phase. After that, again. So after that, after a little while, maybe like a couple of Celsius, it would start to actually sort of more liquefy it until it got to the point where it would be fully liquid. And then I'm not sure at what point it would turn into a gas. It would also say it there. It's up there, yeah. 1745. It's way too high. So here, we are seeing a temperature change first. Then, when it hits 327, we'll see a phase change. Then after that, it will continue to elevate temperature up to 475. This is for lead, for lead, based on the boiling or the melting temperature of lead given in the table. So if I'm writing this down in formulas, first formula, what is it? We have a double, guys, right? Keep going. First formula. What would I use to find the energy needed to raise the temperature? What formula do I use for that? Come on, we just went over these a second ago. Which one for temperature? Which one involves temperature? Go ahead, Marilyn. Uh, Q equals MC delta T. We'd have to use that for the first part because we have a solid lead form and its temperature is changing. The second part, what do we use? The second part, what do we use? When it's changing phase, what does the formula become? Yeah, so if I solve for Q, it's just ML. I'm going to do that for now. Mass times latent heat of fusion. That's going to be LF. Why am I putting LF? Because this is going from a solid to a liquid. Solid to a liquid. The LF value is given right here in the table. That is the value of LF in that table. And then finally, afterward, we have to go back to lead as a liquid, though, now. And again, do MC delta T. The delta T's are different. This delta T is a much bigger delta T than this one is. But the C value of lead as a liquid and the C uh, as a solid and the C value of lead as a liquid may be different also. So this is the process that we would undergo. Okay, that we would undergo. Take like a two minute break. We're gonna do one example of this. Okay, we're gonna do, actually, take a little break. Take a two minute break, guys. So, first, first. Take a look at this graph for a minute. We're almost done, guys. We're almost done. We got, we've got ice here. Then the ice warms up enough to become an ice water mixture. Then the water warms enough, warms up enough to become water steam mixture. 
and it's all steam, and the steam continues to elevate its temperature. What you'll notice, though, if you look at the actual energy levels at these instances, it takes a lot more energy, like we said earlier, to boil water than it does to freeze water. To actually go through the freezing process to figure out how much energy it takes, take this number minus this number. It's pretty simple, 3.85 minus around 0.5. So you're looking at like 3.3, and this is in kilojoules, right? This is measured in kilojoules. So if I look at the boiling process, I've got 30.6 minus around 8. Okay, so we're looking at around 22.6 kilojoules. So it takes a lot more energy. We're looking at 3.3 kilojoules compared to 22.6 kilojoules. So almost seven times as much energy in this case. And this really just comes to the fact that your LV value is greater than LF for water. The latent heat needed to change the phase from a liquid to a gas is greater than the LF value. Now, the other class had a great question. This is a figure from an old text. It's really poorly done when you think about it. Because this gap from here, here, take a look. From here to here, this represents a gap of 3.3, right? And then this represents a gap of 22.6 over here. So clearly it's not proportional, right? What they're trying to show you here with this little line, in case you're wondering, means that there's like a skip. They're skipping a bunch of data points to show that if they really drew this to be proportional, this line segment right here, this line segment right here, would be a lot greater. You wouldn't have this big skip in the graph. Realistically, what they should have done is made this like a shorter region, made this a bit longer to show that this is at least bigger than this, and still have the little squiggly. Because this amount of heat is much greater than this amount of heat needed. Okay, so theoretically, this is not done right because the horizontal axis looks shorter over here and it looks longer over here. And since that's the measurement of heat, it should kind of be the opposite way around. Okay? The LV value is used in stage D. In stage A, you use a specific heat capacity of ice. In stage B, you use LF. In stage C, you use a specific heat capacity of water. In stage D, you use LV. In stage E, you use a specific heat capacity of steam. Yeah, in the phase change, that's when you use L, because if you remember your formulas, when you're changing temperature in this phase, in this part, and in this part right here, you're going to be using MC delta T. But for the areas where there's a phase change occurring, you're going to use ML. Okay, these are both going to be using M times L to calculate the amount of heat needed to change the phase. All right? And that's where we're going to stop for today. So let's, look, let's take a look at an example of this now. So this just says determine the amount of thermal energy that must be added to 0.96 kilograms of ice at zero degrees Celsius to make water at zero degrees Celsius. So at first when you look at this, it sounds a little bit like ridiculous. It's at zero and it's going to zero. So your first instinct could be, oh, the answer is just zero. The answer is just zero. Because if I'm not changing the temperature, I'm not adding any heat. I don't have to add any heat or add any energy to this to not change the temperature, right? But what do we notice? Even though we're not changing the temperature, something else is changing here. And it's the phase, the phase. Are you gonna say that, Martha? Sorry. The phase is changing. Martha, do you remember the formula for phase change? What formula will we use? Slide back up on your notes and use the formula. Tell us the formula for phase change. Yeah, and when we solve for Q, what did that become? Good. Q equals M times L. And that M times L is not milliliter, please, okay? For those that were not awake last class, that's not milliliter there. It's mass times the actual constant. What does L stand for? What does L stand for? Oh, I was going to say liter. Not liter here. Remember, it's not liter, Jack. Not yet, yeah, you're right. L does stand for liter, though, in other terms. For, for now, though, what does L stand for? Not the boiling point. Something to do with boiling or something to do with freezing, either of those, but not the point itself. Good. What does that mean now? You're right. That's the term from what we defined. Yeah, it's the amount of heat needed to change phases. Let's say that, right? So it's called the latent heat in your notes, right? But it's the amount of heat needed or energy needed to change phases. It's a rating, really, from one phase to the next of how much is necessary. Where do we get that value? Where do we get that L value? Yeah, it's in a table, okay? And this is LV. I'm sorry, LF. LF. Because we're going from ice to water. 
When we go from ice to water, that's going from a solid to a liquid, and that's called fusion. That's what we call fusion. From a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a solid. We have this in our notes. It's actually written for you. That was called the latent heat of fusion. So we're going to use the LF value for water. Okay, the mass is given. That's easy. In your table, what's the LF value for water? The LF value for water. What do you have there? Yeah. 3.33 times 10 to the fifth. And the units of this are joules per kilogram. Why do you think that is? Why are the units joules per kilogram? Or at the end of the year, people should know this. At least half the class instinctively should know this at this point. Why are those units definitely joules per kilogram? Even if you didn't know before this problem, you have this written down. How do I know that this has to be joules per kilogram? Yeah, I want energy, right? Q is energy. Kilograms are going to cancel, leaving me with joules. Kinetic energy was measured in joules. Work was measured in joules. Potential energy, joules. Okay, that's our unit of energy that we've talked about. So we'll get around 319,000 joules, it looks like. 319680 joules. Okay, that's the amount of energy necessary just to change the phase. This has nothing to do with the temperature change. This has nothing to do with the temperature change. So we looked at a mathematical example where the temperature change occurred between like a, a piece of metal and then the water around it with calorimetry. Then we looked at the temperature, then we looked at the phase change here where there is no temperature change occurring at all. And then the last case we're going to look at is when they both occur. Okay, when they both occur. How do you think that would look? What would we have to do for a problem like that? Where the temperature and the phase changes both. Okay, imagine ice, it melts, and then the water itself starts to warm up also. How are we going to incorporate that into one problem where both change? What do you think? Just use your gut. How do we find the total energy of all those pieces? Yeah, sum them together. We're just going to sum those, phase cha or those changes together. So we'll look at a phase change, we'll look at a temperature change, and see how they're affected at the same time. So this is the problem. We've got 500 grams of water, and then it gets turned into steam. And we see in this case, though, we've got a temperature change. We definitely have a temperature change. This is the kind of problem that you have to be able to do on the test, right? This is the kind of math problem that you'll definitely see this and probably the example number one from these notes. Example one was calorimetry and then this one here. Because this one really incorporates example two. So example two is just kind of a lead in. That was an easy version of this. So here we have to consider we're going from water and we're going into steam and we're elevating temperature in both ranges. What's the boiling point of water? And if we didn't know, you, could, you probably you should know this, but if you didn't know it, you would look it up on the table. But we need the boiling point of water because we're going from a liquid to a gas, so it's got to boil. What's the boiling point of water? 100. So really here, what we're doing is we're going, from a, we're going from 50 Celsius to 100 Celsius first. We're heating up the water. That's all we're doing. We're heating up the water. Then what happens to the water? Atticus, focus, man. Come on, stop with the giggling. What happens to the water then? We're heating up the water from 50 to 100. Then what happens to it? It begins to evaporate. Begins to evaporate. Very good. So then we have a phase change. And what's the temperature still? Theoretically. It's not really. It probably elevates a little bit. But theoretically, it's still 100 degrees. It's still 100 degrees. And then once it's all into gas or it's all been evaporated, it goes from 100 degrees all the way up to the final temperature of 130. Now, keep in mind that these values, these ranges have different specific capacities. So the C value here and here are different. And the L value here is different than the C value here. And it's a completely different formula. So what are the formulas that we're going to use? We know the phase change. We just did it. Martha told us. What was that, Martha? The formula for, this, for the phase change here. Q equals? Get that recording. There we go. So that's Q equals ML right here. That's kind of the easier part. Now, is it LF or LV? LF or LV? It's boiling, right? It's boiling. What do you got? LV. V stands for, in this case? Latent heat of vaporization, evaporation, boiling. All those things are the same thing. Okay? LV. Now, 
The other ranges, what formula are we going to use? What formula are we going to use the other ranges? There's another one we did in this section. There's only one more, right? What do you think it is? What do you got? LF. Not LF. Sorry, that's the other version of this one. The, co the total other formula. MC delta T. Because we have a temperature change, right? So we know we have to have delta T in these problems now. And just think about it, right? When you're labeling the problem like this, you're seeing a temperature change, so recognize the formula should have delta T in it. When it's only a phase change, the formula does not have a delta T in it because you're not changing temperature there, you're just changing the phase. So you heat up water, it boils off, you heat up the steam. That's physically what's happening in this problem. Now, we need to know what these values are. We need the C value of water and we need the C value of steam. They're different. Even though it's the same substance and they're both H2O, it's not the same C value. So the specific heat capacity changes. We have to refer to our table to see where that is. What do we have for steam and for water? For steam and for water. I'll call this first one C1 and the other one C2. And I'll call that delta T1 and delta T2. So we have subscripts so we can refer to them. What's C1? Do you have C1 for me, Travers? Yeah. Go ahead. That's for water. For water, yeah. yeah. And then C2 is the C value for steam. For steam. Now, if we recognize here, first of all, we've talked about this a couple of times now, the specific heat capacity of water is higher than steam, and I think it's also higher than ice, right? Yeah, ice is, yeah, a little bit lower. Ice is a little bit higher than this, but still lower. Um, the C value indicates how much energy as a rate will be needed to elevate the temperature. Okay, so this means that you need more energy to elevate the temperature of water than you do to elevate the temperature of steam. That's what it actually means. Okay, just like the L value told us really how much energy as a rate we need to change the phase of a substance. This is how much energy is needed to elevate the temperature. That's what it really is. Again, though, we just have to plug it in, right? All we have to do is plug it in. So in the first scenario, let me slide these over actually so we can see all this stuff. In the first scenario, we've got, and these are all the same M value, right? What's the M value for all of these? What's the M value in all cases? What's the M value? Yeah, 0 0.5, okay? And it's in kilograms. Remember, in the problem, it's given in grams. Everything we've looked at this year has been in kilograms, so you've got to convert that to start. Delta T is pretty easy, okay? If you have the delta T value, it's TF minus T initial. Just subtract the two, right? So in the first case, delta T is, 500, is 50, and in the second case, it's just 30. This is going to be 50, and this is going to be 30. It's how much the temperature changed by. 100 minus 50, 130 minus 100 for the second part. Now, we can plug all these in and sum these values together. So we've got 0.5 times the specific heat capacity of water times 50, which is the temperature change. In the second part, we've got the mass again, 0.5 times the L value. What's the LV value? I still don't know what I didn't write down down here. What's LV? We have for the latent heat of vaporization. So from, from water into steam. Angie, what do you have? Uh, times 10 to the? Six. Sixth, okay. And then finally, the last part is mass times the specific heat capacity of steam, which is 2.01 times 10 to the third. That was in the table also times the temperature change, which is 30 degrees. So you have three portions of this problem. You've got the first portion of elevating the temperature as water, the second portion as evaporating it, the third portion as elevating the temperature of the steam. Okay, sum these three values together, you'll find the total required energy for this process to be under, undergone, underwent. Okay, if you'd actually perform this process. Sum those three values together. Hey, look at their relative values too. Notice, what do you get for, just give me the, give me the answers for each individual Q, because you're going to see big significant differences here, right? Q1, what did you get, Travers? Yeah, around 100,000 for Q1. Q2, though, what was that around? 
Anyone get Q2 yet? What was that number around? We don't, we don't have functioning calculators? 17 out of 18? What was the fine, yeah, what was the Q answer for the second one right here? N times L, what do we get as a number? It's just a multiplication. The last one here is 30,000. So we've got 100,000 for the first one and around 30,000 for the third one where the temperature changes occur. What about where the phase change occurs, though? Look at the difference. It's important to recognize these numbers so we can see the significance of this. What do we end up getting for that last one there, for the, for the phase change? Where is that? What do you got? Yeah, you get like over a million for that. So again, we mentioned this in the last section, in the last slide, or two slides ago, with the heating curve for water. I talked about how it takes a lot of energy to change the phase of, some, of something. And specifically in this case, it's a lot more energy to change the phase than it is to elevate the temperature. You get, again, around 100,000 for Q1. I'll slide this over a little further so I can write these answers. You get around 100,000 here. I'm putting around. You get around a million here. And here you get around 30,000 only. So it turns out that it takes the most energy to change the phase in this process than it does compared to the actual temperature change. Several reasons. One, the temperature change wasn't very great. It was only 50 degrees and 30 degrees. Two, the latent heat of vaporization, this is really taking into account both of these things, right? The mass hasn't changed. So this number is really replacing <coughs> these two numbers. And clearly, this number is bigger than these two multiplied by each other, just by looking at it. Okay, this is going to be approximately, as a total Q, uh, 1.26 million, it looks like. Okay, that's the approximate total value when you add the actual. Remember, these numbers are not exact. I put approximations. This was like 1.15 million or 1.13 million. The other one was 104,000 and then 30,150. Okay, so those numbers are approximations. This is the total number. This is a pretty straightforward mathematical process that anyone can reproduce. There's really very little variation in a problem like this. The material either starts as a solid, melts, and becomes a liquid, maybe it goes further, and then melts, and then it evaporates and becomes a gas. That'd be like a five-stage process. You'd have Q1, Q2, Q3, Q2, Q5, all those different parts. Or you have, in this case, where it goes from a liquid, evaporates into a gas. So there's not really any way to vary this. So when it comes down to it, when you just practice these problems for homework and practice them on your reviews, it should be a pretty straightforward question on the test. The calorimetry, if anything, would probably be the tougher one. That was the example one that we did in this section where we said Q1 equals Q2. The heat loss from that piece of metal that went into the water was gained by the water. That's why we said Q1 equals negative Q2, okay? We have a little bit of time. You guys have like 10 minutes, and I knew we were gonna end short here. Take the time to start the homework. Okay, if you want to grab the textbook, take a quick picture or two. I have another textbook in the